So the guys at the Modern Maker podcast, which I totally recommend, it's really good, they just announced this contest a while ago where you have to build something using only a sheet of plywood, and then you can use some other stuff like glue and screws and stuff like that if you want to. Um, and as soon as they announced it, my immediate reaction was, ugh, I don't want to do that. I just finished this huge project that was basically plywood cabinets that I had to put in, and it was kind of a nightmare. And I don't really like building stuff out of plywood, and I'm not, like, such a huge furniture builder to begin with. I'd really rather do something on the lathe right now. Like, I really like making bowls. And I'm like, I can't make a bowl out of plywood. Oh, wait. No, I could totally do that. Okay, let's do that. So you're supposed to use nothing but a sheet of plywood for this build, and then glues and screw and whatever. This is about half a sheet of plywood that I had left over, and this here is a big chunk of particle board. And I'm ripping the particle board, cross-cutting it into some small pieces, and then I'm going to make a box out of it. I have an idea to make a bowl that combines broken plywood and colored resin together, and I need a container that's going to hold all of that. So I glue the sides of the box together and then pin them real quick with my brad nailer and then I've got a complete box and since I'm going to be using resin I really don't want it to stick to the inside and I don't want it to leak so I'm going to paint the entire interior with clear lacquer to try and waterproof it and make it look less sticky. I'm also going to put on this piece of clear Lexan so that it's better for filming and also so I can see what's going on while I'm pouring the resin and it's not all just a mystery to me. So I've got some epoxy holding that on and I'm also using a lot of screws. I need all the seams to be waterproof, and so I'm just using this silicon caulk here. I own a caulk gun, but I don't honestly like messing around with it. I love the silicone caulk in the tube because you can just put it on and it works really well. And then I'm ripping the actual pieces of plywood down to about 10 inches in width. There's some tape and junk because they're left over from another project. And then I'm cross-cutting them, and I think they're about 10 individual pieces. And as I kept working, they got smaller and smaller, and that was intentional. It'll make sense why I did that a little bit later on. Here I have them all stacked together, and you can see them getting smaller. And I'm making this diagonal line here, and that's where I'm going to break all of these pieces. So, it uh, turns out plywood's actually very difficult to break, specifically because it's engineered to be difficult to break. So I had to come up with this really complicated setup where I weaken it with the drill, then I do a pilot hole, and then I run my jigsaw through it. Uh, trying to break this stuff, I actually tore my vise off my bench at one point and had to remount it. So I really had to give it some thought. Turns out the best thing to do is to put these screw clamps on and then jerk them back and forth. And I'm pretty much pulling on them as hard as I can. And even with that cut and those screw holes, it's still very difficult to get this stuff to break. But it eventually breaks and it does it in this very splintery, ragged way, which is exactly what I'm looking for. This is going to give me the look that's going to make this bowl really dramatic and interesting. You can see all the pieces stacked up and all the ragged ends. And uh, I'm going to be using resin with this, and I don't want it to stick to the container too much. So I have this Carnuba wax, and I'm just going to do a coat of that all over the inside. I don't have any mold release spray, and I'm too cheap to buy some, but this should work. It makes perfect sense. I'm stacking the different pieces of plywood here, and I'm using a lot of glue, much more than I would usually use because I don't want the resin leaking in between the different sheets of ply when I pour it in. So I put on a lot of wood glue, and then I stack the plywood, and then I put these pieces of railroad track on top as clamps. This probably took me two or three days, because I would only do two, maybe three layers at once, and then I'd let them dry overnight and then add more with a lot of weight on top to keep everything really well compressed. Now I've got the whole thing, and I'm ready to start pouring the resin. This is just Famo Wood Bar Top Resin. It's probably the cheapest two-part epoxy you can get. Um, but it has a lot of advantages, like for instance, you can color it with regular food coloring. So I'll leave links to the food coloring and to the resin down in the description if you want to experiment with this stuff. It's only about $22 a quart, which is a pretty good price for a, a decent two-part resin. And um, I've got 25 drops of food coloring in this first batch. It's really dark, and the idea is that I'm going to add a little bit less coloring with each pour so that the resin gets clearer and clearer and looks more like glass. Here's the first pour, and you can see this time-lapse spread. Oh, and this bubble that I got. I really liked the way that looked on camera. 
and I'm continuing the pours. This is probably pour number two, so it's 20 drops. Here's pour number three. It's only got 15 drops of coloring in it, and it's starting to get lighter. And now I want to take up some space so I can save some resin. I'm going to turn away all the middle on the lathe anyway. So I just jam some scraps of wood in there. And here's my next resin pour. And I'm probably down to 10 drops. Then this one is 5 drops of color. And you can see I'm getting this nice turquoise color. It's really changing color beautifully as I go up further pouring mold. And this is my last pour right here, and I'm down to three drops of color here, so it's almost totally clear. And, but it's done, which is good, because it took three quarts of resin. And now it's 72 hours to cure, so there's a lot of waiting. But after three days, it's done. I was hoping it would come out of the mold easily, but all of that clear lacquer and wax, none of that made any difference. It's still stuck in there as much as it possibly could have. So I just took an old framing chisel and pounded it down in the sides as hard as I could. And they were pretty tough to get off. And you can even see with this side here, with the chunks of ply that were stuck to the sides, it didn't do any good, the wax. And now I finally have this giant chunk of resin and plywood, and it's a little intimidating. I have to turn a bowl out of this thing. The first thing I have to do is get rid of these pieces of wood sticking out, and since it won't fit on my bandsaw or my table saw, I just use a rip saw for that. And whenever I'm working on the lathe, I really like to be precise. I find the exact center, and then I draw a circle around that so I know exactly what I'm keeping and what's going to be waste. I've got to get rid of the waste somehow, and here's what I came up with. This is just a cheap Harbor Freight chainsaw. It costs about 40 bucks, but it worked surprisingly well for this. It was pretty precise, it left a decent surface, and I was able to quickly eliminate all the waste. You might wonder why I did this since I own a bandsaw, because it's awesome, and it makes me look like a badass. That's why. And now that I've got the waste removed, I can put the faceplate on and get it mounted on the lathe. I gotta admit, I was getting a little bit nervous by this part. This is definitely the biggest thing that I've ever turned. It weighs mm, 15 or 20 pounds, and it's, it's right at the limit of this lathe's capacity. And I'm pretty freaked out turning it on, but I've come this far, so here we go. And, uh, okay, not bad. A little bit of vibration, but uh, it's pretty decent. This is a Harbor Freight lathe, too, and it's not super robust, but it'll get the job done. I'm coming in here with a carbide tool first, but I wasn't really happy with the way that worked, so I switched over to my homemade DIY bowl gouge. I've got a video on that you can check out. I really like this tool for almost any kind of faceplate turning I do, because it's as heavy as a carbide tool, but because the tip is high-speed steel, you can just sharpen it as much as you want, and it's always razor sharp. And then after a bit of work with that, I switched to this round nose scraper. This one's particularly good for anything that's like bowl work, where I want to remove a lot of material but also leave a good finish. It's not as aggressive as the pointed tool, but it has these nice long shavings and it leaves a surprisingly smooth surface, particularly on the outside. Now, I will admit, I did have to stand there for hours getting tons of crap flung at my face, and maybe it's time for me to invest in a face shield. I'll probably think about that, because it's not very pleasant. Now I'm starting to shape the, the actual outside of the bowl. I want it to be a kind of simple and organic shape. The composition of the bowl is crazy enough that I don't need a weird shape to make it interesting. I just want something that's going to be round and pleasing. And I'm sticking with the round nose scraper and doing long, continuous strokes with it so that I keep that good surface and the shape can just emerge kind of organically. And then I'm scraping the outside with a dedicated scraper. This shot looks a little bit weird. It looks like the camera's moving. It's not. It just can't figure out what to focus on. And I decided to leave it in just because I thought it looked cool. And the scraper gave me an excellent surface by the time it was done and I was ready to move on to the interior of the bowl. Now anytime I'm doing an interior, I like to start by coring out the middle. It saves a ton of time and makes it a lot easier. I'm using a two inch Forstner bit that I've got mounted in my lathe's tailstock. And that's a big bit and there's a lot of torque here. So I'm just going really slowly. My technique is really simple. I advance the bit just one or two turns with the tailstock wheel and then I back it off and clear out all the chips. If I let the chips build up too much, the whole thing could bind and seize up and that would be really dangerous. 
Here, I've gone as deep as I can possibly go with the tailstock. I've got to unlock it and pull it all the way back. And you can see how clogged the thing has become with shavings. It would have been dangerous to go any further with this, but it's fine the way it is. Now I need to hollow out down to the depth that I've drilled. And I'm back with the round nose scraper again, and I'm just taking those long, continuous strokes. I spent several hours hollowing just down to the bottom of that first hole but the shape is coming out nicely, the wall thickness is good, and I'm about halfway down. So now I need to drill it again, and now I'm past those pieces of wood filler I put in, and I'm down to drilling just pure resin, which leaves these hilarious, like, blue noodle shavings that feel really weird and funny in the hand, and they look really cool. And then once I've got it drilled down to my bottom depth, then I hollow it out the rest of the way. I'm just finishing off knocking down some of the high spots with my carbide tool, and then I'll scrape it again. And now I'm sanding the exterior and the inside of the bowl. The scraper left a good finish, so I only have to use like 150 grit, and I end up with a fine surface. The problem I have is this plywood is a very porous surface with a lot of end grain and a lot of fibers sticking up. I need to fill that in and stiffen it somehow, so I give it three coats of West System Epoxy, let it dry overnight. I've got a nice glossy finish, but it's got a lot of bubbles and nibs in it. So even though it looks good, I've got to sand the whole thing down again to get my finish back and make it really good to the touch. Here I am wet sanding with mineral spirits and wet and dry automotive paper. I always use mineral spirits for woodworking projects because it doesn't swell the fibers if it actually comes in contact with the wood. And I go all the way to a really high grit, I think it's 1500, and then I move on to swirl remover, which is also a buffing compound. I get that on the bowl and then spin it up to a high speed, and I work with that for a while, and then I switch to automotive polish. And you can see I'm using a paper towel to apply all this stuff. It's not as effective as a rag, but you never bring a rag to a lathe that can be very dangerous. Paper towel's a lot safer. And now the finish is back to what I'm looking for. It's transparent again. It has that sort of uh, sea glass or bottle glass effect that I was going for. You can see my hand through it there. It's, it's really perfect. Now comes sort of the most nerve-wracking part. I've gotten the bowl to be exactly what I wanted it to be, but I've got to get it off the lathe somehow. Um, I could ruin everything here if I'm not careful and it comes flying off the lathe and shatters against the wall. That's happened to me before. So I'm just very carefully parting it off until the parting tool starts to hit the screws from the faceplate, and I realize that I've got to take it off and do it by hand. I'm just going around with a Japanese pull saw here. It's very fine, it's good for the work. But then I realized the saw could damage the bowl just as easily as the lathe could have, so I tape up the bottom and then keep working on it, going around in a circle and slowly just deepening that kerf, keeping a nice straight cut until I get it off. Now a lot of woodworkers have fancy chucks they use to flip bowls around and work on the bottom, but I just use a random orbital sander and then a piece of sandpaper stuck to something flat like glass or plastic. I get a great bottom that way and I don't have to mess around much. And here's the final finished product, and I have to say, it's exactly what I thought it would be. It isn't very often that I get to make something that really is the vision that I had in my head, and it comes out looking like what I had in mind. This took me like two weeks, and especially when it was just a big chunk of plywood and resin, I was looking at it and thinking, my god, there's no way this is actually going to turn into a bowl or something attractive. But in the end it did. I'd like to thank the guys at the Modern Maker Podcast for their totally stupid, I mean, their excellent, their very excellent contest that I'm honestly really happy to be a part of. Um, go check out their podcast if you haven't so far. And uh, if you like this video, you can go check me out on Patreon and look at the exclusive content and rewards I have for my supporters. Uh, my patrons make my content possible, and I really appreciate them. So anyway, I hope this was as much fun for you as it was for me. Thanks for watching.